in the book here. Thank you so much for having me. goes way back um, to high school. So I'm a WA boy, I went to Cross High, um, and I was in year 10 in metalwork class. Wasn't the best student, uh, still I'm not the best student. Um, and the teacher said, well, we finished everything we needed to do, now you can make whatever you want. And I looked at the teacher and I went, um, I want to build a motorbike. <laughs> that was his reaction. He said, you have to be an engineer to do that. So I looked at the teacher and I looked at the uh, work we were doing and I went, alright. So then, uh, yeah, I went into engineering at UWA. Um, while I was at high school, they told me I was probably going to go to uni because of my grades. Uh, straight through. And then about 12 months into uni, I got a letter from the university uh, saying, we're going to kick you out, you know, fix your grades up. So I went, alright. So I did that too. Um, got into the workforce straight after uni. Started working at a company called Legendary and pretty much got started working on motorbikes at the same time. So I finally had a job where I could actually pay to buy some parts, buy some metal, um, start putting things together, buy a welder, things like that. So that was back in 2015, and I'll go through the bike story in the, in the next slide. But basically, fast forward three years of um, slaving away, and then I worked really, really hard, had a lot to learn, a lot more than I realised. Um, I took a holiday, and I went to Europe, I went to Motor Valley, so Ferrari Museum, Lamborghini Museum, Ducati, and Pagani. And it's at the Pagani Museum uh, where I learned about Farage's story and how he worked at Lamborghini before he started his own thing. Um, and so I looked at that and looked in the mirror and went, all right, that's what I've got to do. And uh, about six weeks later, I was totally moved over to Melbourne, um, with a new job, and started working in the automotive industry. And I'm still working, uh, currently at Ford, it's a day job, and I absolutely love it. It's one of the best jobs I've ever had, so I feel very fortunate. Um, so yeah, that's, and here we are today. So, just a little bit about motorbikes. Um, a lot of people came in today to probably hear that part of it, more so than my story. So on the first pallet, we've got four pallets, and that's, that's our progression over the last five years. So the very first pallet you can't see from here, there's a frame on the ground, um, and you'll see the welds on that. Um, that's when we learned that you probably should use an inert gas in your welding. Um, <laughs> so the welds are kind of horrendous. Um, but we learned quite quickly. So that red bike with the red frame, that's a frame we actually built ourselves, and there's six months between that first frame and that red bike. All the bodywork on it was handmade by us, <coughs> sculpted with clay with no experience, and built with fiberglass bodywork. There was side panels, but they're, I don't even know what they are anymore. Um, and yeah, so needless to say, that bike remained a static prototype. Um, we had no idea about fabrication when we started, and messed it up completely halfway through, and just finished it, and now it looks like a bike. So that was a great achievement for us. So that was 2016. We spent all of 2017 planning, designing, we took all those lessons we learned in that six month period and we went back to the drawing board. A uh, new designer joined us, Dave Hendrod, we were very fortunate to have him. Um, and we developed a concept for the 2018 bike, which is the third color. So this was the first bike that we built that ran on the road, it felt like a motorbike, it looked like a motorbike, and we were super proud of it. Um, the bodywork on both these two bikes is hand formed aluminium done by a company called Jew and Design down in Caram Downs. They're phenomenal guys. Um, and we built that bike through 2018 and we got a call from the Motorbike Expo, or Moto Expo, and they said, We'd really like to have you along. Would you be interested in launching your bike at our show? And I looked at the bike, 
you want the phone? I went, all right. And so we did that too. Um, we scrambled and raced to the finish as you normally do for our product launches. Um, but we got a really, really good response from the market. We got our first orders and our first customers, which we weren't expecting. We did no marketing at all. We built a Facebook page 24 hours before the launch. Um, and within a couple of days of the launch, we, were, we had global articles coming out of us, and that was just a totally new experience. And yeah, really, really fortunate. So we learned a lot through that bike as well. Um, the weight distribution is totally wrong, um, but we can take on all the things we learned and all the lessons we learned in that bike um, to develop this one. One thing that we learned halfway through 2018 is that an off-the-shelf motor and an off-the-shelf powertrain just isn't going to cut it for performance. And so we were building this bike and at the same time we started designing the 2019 bike. So we developed our own powertrain from the ground up, our own motor, our own battery modules, um, re-engineered the frame, single-sided swing arm. Um, it was just, it's a completely different beast that looks very, very similar to the 2018 bike. It's something we're incredibly proud of. Um, and we're now weeks away from starting our first test, which is absolutely amazing. So, shout out to the team over there in the back corner. Just wave your hands. Yes, yeah, so it's now clear. <laughs> so it takes a lot of effort to, um, to put these things together, right? It's a lot of hours, uh, quite literally, a lot of sweat and tears. Um, and the, the team have done a phenomenal job. We've had a minuscule budget so far. Um, and so for us to get to where we are now is, is really well for the moment. So, where are we at right now? Um, we started our capital raise a few weeks ago um, and we've done 75% already, which is, again, amazing. Never done that before. We got a fund on board. Didn't expect that, that's cool. Um, we are now looking for our own workshop and our own showroom, which is an absolute dream come true, so that's really, really cool. Um, and we expect to start delivering our first production bikes in November this year. Our plan is to build three or four customer bikes and hand them over at the show. So as you can see, we hired a very high-end model for this photo shoot. Um, where are we going? Basically, we're doing motorbikes, right? Production, designer, electric motorbikes. That's our bread and butter, that's what we love doing. Um, but we are going to be developing a line of gear and merchandise to help build that brand and help take us global. Um, but we are going to start in Australia alone. <coughs> bike deliveries are going to be Australia alone for the next couple of years. And we have our vision to go global in the next five to ten, which is pretty exciting as well. A little bit about the technology. Um, so I've delved into the motorbike progression, but we are going to be developing a keyless experience for riders. Um, it actually works out a lot cheaper for the business to go keyless, and it's super cool. It's a win-win. Um, we've got a world-class user experience that we're developing, and Kim, our software engineer, can pick his brains on that. Um, battery technology, so the cells that we're using in this bike are our own module, they're a pouch cell, um, there's a sample on that first pallet down there, you're welcome to have a look, just don't lick the terminal, uh, really dangerous. Um, and we're completely re-engineering this battery pack for production as well. So we've been approached by a global battery supplier um, to supply us for cells, which has been amazing, um, and warrants a total redesign of the battery pack. Control systems, we've got some very exciting things coming with control systems, with electronics, we do a lot of fancy things, um, and I'm not going to spoil the surprise for a lot of these things. Um, but yeah, Peter is uh, our controls engineer. Um, he's ex Formula One, ex Red Bull Air Racing, and he's got some pretty crazy ideas that I love. Um, I'm not sure they're all legal yet, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and obviously, the proprietary powertrain that we've developed from the ground up. So, the powertrain unit for us is fully stressed in the frame, it's liquid cooled. Um, it's one of a kind, it's, it's our own design, which is, I still can't believe we have. Um, but it is a, a beautiful platform that we're going to be using across multiple product lines for four different types of motorcycles um, that we are developing concepts for right now. 
So that's that's it from me. Happy to answer any questions you might have. And again, thank you so much for coming. started road testing yet so we don't quite know the 2018 bike we tested on the road um, but we had a flaw in our design where the chain rubbed against the swing arm and so it made like a really chainsaw like noise which is super cool um, not good for durability um, but yeah it's, it's gonna sound, it's gonna have a slight hum we predict um, but it's gonna be really really quiet as we've gone to a belt drive the weight of the bike and also the um, Yep, so in terms of range or years of usage? Uh, range of the Yep, so with the top spec bike we're looking at about 200 kilometers cruising on the freeway. Um, what was the first question? Weight. Weight. So we're targeting, at the moment, we think it's going to be about 210, 220. Um, we are targeting the sub 200, and my day job is an optimization engineer, so I kind of take pride in the weight side of things. Um, so we are we are going to try and get that down as low as possible. Yes. How many models are you going to go through this year? So we've got the one model. This is our C series, um, and we'll start with this one. Um, keep it simple. Get the first one right. Get the quality right. Um, but we are going to start developing the next model in the next. Yep, so if you're empty with the largest battery pack um, from a standard wall plug, um, you're looking at about five, six hours, depending on the pack size that we finish with. Um, we are looking at a DC fast charge option, which will bring that down to anywhere between half an hour to an hour. Um, but we've actually found that a lot of our customers don't necessarily care about having a fast charge option uh, because of a 200 kilometer range. That needs more batteries. Yeah. <laughs> Longer than this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Just Funded companies coming up as well. Um, th there's a few. There's a few main players like Zero and Harley. Damon are a new one that's been funded, I think. Um, there's a couple more that, that escape me at the moment. Um, but our strategy as a business is to deliver vehicles that are of similar specification that are designer at a much lower price point as well. Can't tell ya. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be developing four different bikes off this one platform. Um, they're going to have different geometries, so they're going to be a different style bikes. So for example, we're looking at maybe doing a supermoto. I'm not going to mention the next one we're doing because we're really excited about it. It's going to be a big one. Um, but yeah, they'll have the same platform, different geometries, and totally different bikes. Sorry, just a question down here. Yeah. Uh, in terms of your battery pack, I'm assuming you're using lithium ions for your battery packs. Yeah, lithium or lithium in general. Lithium, phosphate, nickel, manganese, cobalt. Yeah. Um, are they running what, 24 volts? 20 volts. The, the pack voltage? Yeah. About 150. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Million hours for the whole thing. Obviously, you said uh, you've got a better range. Yeah, so at the moment, battery swap. Battery swap. Yeah. Yeah. swap tape. Um, sorry, capacity of the pack. Um, this current bike is about 10.7 kilowatt hours, um, but with the new cell manufacturer that's engaged us, we think we've got enough room to push that to 14. Um, but there's a bit of a business case trade off that we've got to make a call on. So 
once that design matures, we'll make that whole. Yeah. Sorry, was there no one? Yes. Good question, really tough question. So the question was for those that didn't hear it, what's our brand proposition? What makes our bike special? Um, why would someone buy this bike over another bike? UPS. Um, sorry? UPS. UPS. Unique proposition, unique selling proposition. USB, USB, unique selling proposition. Um, look, there's, in the startup world, this is a bit of a, a science, right? And there's a lot of literature on what USPs you need to have, and they go into a lot of detail. Um, and I never was really driven by this. <coughs> There's a lot of interesting features on our bike that are gonna be unique, like our dash, like our user experience, and the customer experience that we're gonna be, that we're designing at the moment, and um, the design itself is a unique value proposition. Um, but for us, and I mean, we're, the whole team are pretty much riders, right? Um, and, People fall in love with motorbikes because of how they look, how they are designed, how they feel to ride. It's, it's an emotional experience. And for us, the design has always come first. So, I mean, our, don't get me wrong, me and the designer have butted heads many times, um, being on the engineering side and the design side. Um, but we think that if you have a vehicle that performs well, has a decent range, is reasonably priced, and looks like nothing else, and looks amazing, um, that you're gonna win. <coughs> so that's our strategy. Yeah, um, top speed and when can we get test ride? <laughs> top speed, so top speed and test ride. Um, when we've got insurance, we'll start test rides, because of the top speed question. Um, so with, with this bike, we predict we'll get to 160, 170. Um, the motor supplier that sent us this motor, which is one of our test motors, got the specification wrong. So it's one of the, it's a Delta spec, not an Alpha spec. The Alpha, we should get up to about 190, um, which is more than enough for the road. Um, and, sorry? Legally. Yes, legally. Um, and test rides, we hope in the next month or so. Um, we, we were hoping in March, um, but we want to do a lot of testing on the bike to make sure it's safe um, and that, you know, nothing's going to break and also, yeah, in the next month, we hope. Sorry, this gentleman was first. Um, you've been now doing this for five years now, so. Yes. Financial, uh, the financial stress that's been, you've been put through, can you go through that? Uh, okay, so the question was, you've been doing this for five years, can you talk about the financial stress? Um, I don't want to cry. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it. No, look, um, as soon as I started working full time, all my money has gone into this. Um, so I was in the oil and gas industry, I was getting a good paycheck, and somehow I was still living paycheck to paycheck, and I have no idea why. Um, I sold my my car to fund motorbike development. Um, so yeah, look, I've had to live off like $10 in a week. So it's, I mean, it's a story of any founder. Um, unfortunate now I've kind of learned to balance that out a little bit better. Um, and we've done a couple of small capital raises from some very generous and um, some awesome investors who really believe in uh, what we're doing. And um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely gotten easier, but we were self-funded up until 2018, so that third bike, everything else, so all the powertrain components I paid for myself. We killed two $4,000 battery packs in like a month because of inexperience and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, look, it's, it's been a challenge, but when you go to pay for whatever you're buying, you go, well, what's, what's the alternative? Do I just quit or do I just pay it and figure it out later? Yeah. So it's been fun. <laughs> yes. Yep. 
Yeah, so with the C series, we've got three different variants. The Alpha, Delta, and the Omega. The Alpha is our top spec, highest performance bike. Delta is a mid-range, like a 600 or something like that. Um, and the Omega is our premium learner bike, right? So it's got a price point of 12,990. Um, and we, because it's electric, you can limit the power output, right? So you look at what the weight is, you limit the power output, so you fall within the lands approvals. Um, so our Omega will be lands approved. I think the limitation, I haven't looked at the legislation in a little while, um, but last time I looked at it, it was 25 kilowatts. So as long as we stick to that, we'll be going. Yes? Um, I don't know if the question which was acceleration. Yep. Um, and unrelated. Yes. Are there so many issues with the battery factory? Okay, so um, I've forgotten the first one already. Acceleration. Acceleration yeah. and battery pack and crap. So acceleration with the alpha, look, we've done mathematical modeling, which is normally done with these types of developments. Um, and we predict with the current draw we'll get we'll get 3.5 seconds, 0 to 100. Um, so it's quite quite decent, um, we think. Um, but physical testing will prove or disprove that theory or estimation. And safety in a crash. Um, so Look, the modules themselves and the cells themselves go through quite brutal testing. So, I mean, recently the supplier sent us the test document for the cell that we're probably going to use in production, um, and they literally hit it with a hammer, they puncture it, they abuse it, um, and they see if there's any uh, thermal runaway properties. So that's when you can't control the, the thermals of the cell. Um, and that's been one of our big things. We've always wanted a safe cell, um, so a safe battery pack at the cell level. Having said that, there's a lot of other considerations you need to make with the overall battery pack. So um, in a crash, it's not just the batteries that can cause an issue. Um, if you crash and you short the high voltage terminals, it's not a good thing. Um, normally, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you think about it, when you come off a bike, you're normally separated from the bike. Um, so that is a safety feature of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so yeah, look, we're taking all those things into consideration in the design, um, and the pack as a pack will be as safe as we can possibly make it. Um, you know, when it comes to crash, there, there's things you just can't account for, and I mean, any, any rider knows that. Okay. Thanks for that. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, what's the name, Savic and uh, Lion? Yep, so the, us, the question was around the brands, Savage and the Lion, where does that come from? Um, well, my last name's Savage. Okay. I don't know, Dennis Savage. I should have said that at the start. Um, <laughs> and the Lion, um, I really like Lions. Simple as that. No, look, I'm a Leo. Um, when we were building the brand and designing the brand, and Ben helped me out with the branding uh, when we first started, um, we were thinking of an animal. We were like, what animal could we possibly use to represent our brand? And the lion is something, you know, it represents pride, and we're incredibly proud of the bikes that we've built. Um, it represents power, it's the king of the jungle. Um, so all these things kind of factored into the, the lion. And, um, Sam, our, our graphic designer, has just finished uh, refining that logo a lot, so we're really excited to kind of launch that as well. So, okay, there's yeah. a new logo coming in. Oh, very, very similar, just a lot more refined. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, you have a question? Um, you mentioned before with the version 3, is that the version 3? Uh, the, the first one we're playing, right? Yeah, so 2018? Yeah, that one. Yep. Um, you mentioned that it was very unbalanced and the weight distribution was quite bad. Obviously, yep. the 2019 version looks a lot more refined. Yep. In terms of centre of gravity, is it quite low down the actual vehicle? Yep. Is it quite balanced? So, like, we're going to get a little bit technical. The question was around centre of gravity and what the difference is between 2018 and 19. So, with our first bike, look, when I rode it, um, and I was the only one that rode it for safety reasons, um, it felt a little heavy in the front, um, but it rode pretty well. And we took it around Albert Park and managed to actually scrape the battery pack. And that's when we decided we had to up that ground clearance. Um, uh, the weight distribution of 2018 is 60-40 on the front, which is really, really bad. 
throw my butt around. Really bad. Um, but for the amount of resources that we had at the time, that's what it's the best we could do. Um, we haven't actually weighed this bike yet because this is the first time we've had it together um, with the cells and, and the motor in it and everything like that. Um, from the CAD model, and we've done some quite a lot of CAD modeling on this, uh, we've got a 5149 weight distribution. Um, so testing is going to really prove that. Um, and we've got a number of things where we can that we can tweak to modify that. Um, the second question was, is the center of gravity quite low or high? Um, it's, it's neither. There's a sweet spot where the center of gravity needs to be so that you have an agile enough bike um, that's not going to fall over and something doesn't feel too heavy to throw around. So we're really lucky. Our chassis engineer has like, he's a published researcher in dynamics, like motorbike dynamics. Um, so he's pretty hard on us with the series and stuff. So. Yeah. Are we doing it on time? Sorry. Are we doing it on time with questions? Yeah, or we'll just keep going? All right, cool. Talk fast. Talk fast. The schedule maintenance. Um, do, do they need surfacing or um, maintenance of that if we have a module? Yep. So, questions around surfacing and um, are we going to need to maintain the battery pack? We're building in IoT connectivity and um, over-the-air updates with the, with the bike. So we'll be able to log into the bike remotely and check on the health of the battery pack. Um, the reality is with electric vehicle technology, there's not a whole lot of maintenance. The pack is liquid cooled, um, and so you'll need to flush that every once in a while, but it's not as often as a internal combustion engine because it just doesn't get as hot. Um, so virtually no maintenance. Um, but there is going to be your standard brakes and suspension and things like that. Um, so we think that the first, I mean, with the first bikes that we build, we're probably going to have more maintenance than we'll need in reality just to make sure everything's going well and we haven't made any mistakes. Um, but yeah, every few thousand k's we'll have a look at them in our first lot, and from there we'll probably decide how often they need to be done. Maybe every 8,000, maybe 10,000. Um, probably just going to be dependent on the bike. Yes, so the question was, is there going to be a different suspension package for the three models? Yeah, so the Alpha spec is obviously the higher end bike. Um, it's going to be a heavier bike, so you need a different suspension tune. Um, possibly a slightly different weight distribution, different ABS system. Um, so the lower end bike is going to be lighter. We're not sure if we're going to decrease the diameter of the forks or not, because we like the aesthetic of the mini forks on the front, um, but we're going to be working with our suppliers to really iron out those details. Do they run regenerative braking? Yes, yes they do. And you can tune how hard you want your regen to be. So if you like more, you can choose that. If you like less, you can keep that too. Yes. Uh, I saw a review uh, somewhere to the Yeah, yeah, look, we, we do have um, the remainder of the capital raise in the pipeline, um, but we are always looking for new investors, absolutely. Cool. Yes? You talked about IoT and the system updates. So don't you looking at um, on the fly tuning and changing system parameters and such like and people coming to wireless range and perhaps updating stuff as you go? Like while you're riding? Well, not while you're riding, but I mean, you're talking about the connectivity doing the system updates and you yep. have updates and all that sort of stuff. You're talking about doing tuning the system parameters and such like based on the, uh, the bikes and the wire. Yeah, absolutely. So the whole idea of implementing IoT capability into the bike is for us to collect all that data. Um, what that's going to let us do is develop basically digital twin models of the bikes and from there we can really optimise um, the tune of the motor controller and the inverter to do multiple things. We can try and maximise the life of your battery pack or maximise performance, it's not of your choice. Um, maybe we can do both depending on how riders choose to ride them. Um, we are going to have GPS integrated so if customers allow us we'll collect that data as well and um, track you know, how they're using the bikes when they're in the um, and then have a look at how the bike's performing thermally over time and 
yeah, really trying to optimize the system from there. It's, it's virtually the same strategy Tesla used in the early days. Yes. Uh, I'm not really happy with my driver bike, so I do one. Yep. And the most important thing about it is the sound that you make when you not drive, you know, it's like it's not easy to feel. Yep. So this is electric, are you going to talk to yourself? Okay, so the question was um, around sound. And for some people, it's really important for motorbikes to have sound. So the question was, this is obviously electric. So what, what, what's happening with this? Um, so, look, our bikes are really, really quiet at the moment. Um, we do have an option potentially available to add an artificial noise. Um, my personal experience is that I kind of prefer the bike quiet. Um, I haven't experienced any safety issues with cars on the road, um, even when we were out on the road with 2018. Um, I still found cars moved out of the way for me like they would on a normal motorbike. Um, and it's a totally different riding experience than an electric bike. So with a petrol bike, when you rides, you'll know you've got three out of four limbs working all the time. You change your gears, you're braking, front and rear. Um, whereas on this bike, you've got your throttle, no clutch, um, you've got a foot brake that you'll relatively rarely touch because you've got regen anyways, and that's on the rear wheel, um, and you've got your brakes. So you've got, instead of three out of four limbs working all the time, you've got one. Um, on top of that, there's no vibrations, no heat, there's no noise, and it's, it's almost like you're gliding through the air. It's, it's just a totally, you think a motorbike's a motorbike, um, but once you get on one of these and you experience it, it's just something else. Sorry, you had a question? Um, yeah, you just sort of, when you're talking about the uh, sort of on the fly, I don't know about on the fly, but this, the software changes and whatnot. Yep. Um, is that going to be left pretty much closed with just yourself, or is that going to be somewhat open source for the individual to perhaps do their own experiment? Ah, so the question was, with the software updates on the bike, is that going to be open source or is that uh, going to be internal only? Um, yeah, look, uh, to be honest, I think to start with, we'll probably keep it to ourselves, just for safety. Um, now, I don't know any manufacturer that kind of lets you tweak the parameters. There's some degree of control you have, like how much regen you want or don't want, um, how much power output you can put in yourself as well. Um, beyond that, um, the, the bike's quite refined. Like there's a lot of work that goes into doing a really good part um, that probably won't need to be changed. Um, in terms of like aftermarket upgrades, increased performance, I mean people put turbos on bikes in some cases and things like that. Um, when you're dealing with 150 volts and like 500 amps, and if you're not like qualified, it's really dangerous. Um, First-hand experience. <laughs> <laughs> How many days do you think you'll get out of a battery pack? And will that be replaceable? Will that be what, sorry? Replaceable, so we'll be able to change it. So in terms of like total kilometers? Yeah. Um, so one battery pack with the alpha spec will go 150, 200 k's cruising on the freeway, depending on how you're fighting. Um, there's a lifetime of it. Yep, so in terms of life, um, with cells, with these particular cells, the supply sends us data sheets, um, and the capacity will drop to 80% after two to 3,000 cycles. Um, so if you charge and deplete your whole battery pack two to 3,000 times with a, say, 100k range, that's 200 or 300,000 kilometers. Which is quite a lot for a motorbike, so it's virtually the life of the bike. Um, it does, battery health is a factor, so depending on how you ride it, how hot it gets over time, um, how much the cells deteriorate over time, um, that could be sooner. But generally, as, as long as the cells aren't truly abused, um, they'll drop in capacity, they'll never really truly die. Um, and even at that point, when the pack's replaced, if the rider chooses to replace it, we can then use those cells in home energy storage or other things where there's a lot lower uh, loading demand on them. So, super technical question, a lot of Yes? Yeah. 
So the question was around tyres. Are there specific tyres for electric motorbikes? Um, so I will get a little bit technical again. Apologise for that if you're not interested in it. Um, but with tyres, yes, there are tyres being made for electric motorbikes and they tend to be harder, um, which means that you get less rolling resistance, which means you get uh, less losses in the rides, you get a longer range. The trade-off is with hard tyres, and we might have noticed, is that yes, you get more durability, but you get less grip. So there is a bit of a trade-off between how much torque you can actually put down on the road and how hard your tyre is. Um, so if you make it too soft, you won't get the life out of it. You'll be able to put down more power in theory from your temperature. Um, and the harder, sorry, and the softer it is, you put down more and get less life. I don't know which one I said. But, um, so look, there is a trade-off, but tyres for motorbikes have been around for 100 years, and development in those has has gone to a level where you know it's there's no point in us dabbling in it ourselves. Um, it's very expensive to develop a new tyre. It's a long lead item in the automotive industry, um, and there's a lot of options out there. That I mean, a lot of customers generally like a particular brand of tyres. Um, and so normally they'll just pick those and put them on the bike and they'll feel good. So do you think I've got a sign with the same tire how much I am on the Look, it depends on what tire you choose. Um, we've got standard sizing, so 120, 17-inch, 120, 180, front to rear. And so there's, there's a lot of options out there that customers can pick and just swap over. Any plans on a race version, not for the road? Um, I would live. I can, no, I can, fine, I can fine. switch it off. Not live, yeah. not live. I'm just